Hey, I'm Dylan. And I'm Sam. Today we're here to teach you Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering is the world's premier trading card game. And this is video one in a series of videos intended to introduce you to the game and get you started playing. Let's get started. Magic is a trading card game. It's a strategy game where you and other players take part in duels using deadly creatures, dangerous sorceries, weapons, and lots more. The world within Magic is called the Multiverse, and you are a Planeswalker within this Multiverse. A Planeswalker is a being of supreme power, able to travel or walk between different worlds, called Planes. Planeswalker. In these travels, you're going to run into other Planeswalkers and battle for supremacy. Some of these worlds are going to be like the world you know, but most are radically different. Along the way, you're also going to learn things like how to cast spells. Right, and these spells come in lots of different varieties summoning deadly creatures from these far off lands, or commanding the very forces of nature. And everything you've learned along the way, it's represented in the game by cards like these. These cards are what you're gonna take into battle against other players. Just like in other games, you use pieces, in this case, cards, to match wits with your opponents. But unlike most other games, the pieces you use, that is, you know, the cards you're gonna play with, are completely up to you, and the combinations are endless. I really can't think of any other game that offers so much customization. Me either. And out of all the thousands and thousands of cards out there, you get to choose the ones that you want to play with, and your friends do the same. It's like you're the game designer. No scripts, no limits, no rules. No scripts, no limits, and okay, we've got a few rules, but we're going to go over those later. The quickest and easiest way to get cards is to just head to a game store and see what's available. You can find one near you at wizards.com locator. One thing you are bound to find is booster packs, where for a few bucks you get 15 random cards. I picked up one just yesterday and pulled some really powerful stuff, like a Sarah Angel. Oh man, that card is perfect for my deck. You wanna trade? Here, I'll give you, I'll give you Shiv and Dragon for it. Oh yeah, sure, I can really use that. And just like that, we've both improved our decks and explored areas of magic we hadn't before. And that is why trading card games are awesome. And magic continues to be great year after year. You choose the strategies you want and the cards that best fit those strategies, put them together, tweak here and there, you can rule the world. And we're gonna cover all the bases, get you started playing and building your own decks in no time. So check us out in part two, the five colors of mana. Until then, welcome to the multiverse. Hi there, welcome back to the Magic the Gathering Learn to Play video series. I'm Sam. And I'm Dylan. This is part two, the five colors of mana. In this video, we're gonna learn about mana, what it is, what it's used for, and the five different colors of mana. Now, as we learned in part one, magic's all about dueling your opponent by casting spells. And the goal of magic is to reduce your opponent's life total to zero while making sure he or she doesn't do the same to you. Players begin the game at 20 life. To start reducing your opponent's life, you're gonna need to know how to cast spells. Some of these spells might summon fearsome creatures to fight for you. Others uncover timeless treasures or unleash powerful arcane forces. And still, others are gonna let you bend the very rules of the game. In fact, that's a pretty common theme with magic. We'll set up some rules for you and the cards will let you do the unexpected. Now, to cast spells, you rely on a magical energy called mana. In the world of Magic the Gathering, there are five different colors of mana, each represented by its own symbol. As you can see here, each color represents different attributes or strategies you can use throughout the game. Let's take a closer look at what those are. First up is white. White is the color of order, protection, and a real army mentality. White's all about the team. Next up is blue. Blue's strengths are manipulation and deception. Blue prefers to engage in mind games rather than rely on brute force. And that brings us to black. Black likes to win at all costs. It doesn't matter what or who you have to sacrifice as long as you can emerge victorious. Moving to red, we have the color of emotion and passion. Red wants you to stop thinking and start smashing things. And finally, we have green, the color of nature, life, and growth. Green relies on large creatures. Bigger is better. So, these symbols represent the mystical mana that you must use to cast your spells. But where does it come from, and how do we get it? Well, it comes from a type of magic card called a land. There are many types of lands in magic, and a card is a land. It'll say so around the middle of the card. There are five types of basic land cards, one for each color. Your plains will produce white mana, your islands will produce blue mana, your swamps for black, your mountains for red mana, and finally, forest for green. During the game, you'll be able to play one land during each of your turns. So, as the game progresses, you'll gain access to more and more mana, letting you cast more powerful spells. 
Let's take a look at that Sarah Angel I traded for in the last video. Magic cards that aren't lands will have mana symbols in their upper right hand corner. This is the mana cost, and just like it sounds, it tells you how much mana is required so you can pay for and cast the spell. Starting from the right of the card, you will first see two white mana symbols. Now, you know that planes produce white mana, so having two planes will help cast Sarah Angel. However, there is another mana symbol in the mana cost, a three. On many magic cards, you'll see a symbol like that three. It's gonna be a black number in a gray circle. This symbol means that you're gonna need more mana. In this case, three more. But this mana can be any color. So if you have two planes and any three other lands, you'll be able to cast Sarah Angel. So now that we know how to read mana costs, let's put it all together and cast that Sarah Angel. But to do this, we'll need to learn how to produce the mana by tapping our lands. Planeswalkers form a bond with the lands they visit. In the game, that's represented by playing the land cards. When you need mana from that land, you have to draw from that bond to access it. In the game, we call that tapping. To tap a card is to turn it 90 degrees. This shows that it's used for the turn, but on your turn, you get to untap all your tapped cards by returning them to their original orientation. You don't have to tap all of your lands each turn, though. You only tap the cards you need when you need them. So to cast my Sarah Angel, I'll tap two planes to take care of the white mana symbols, then three more lands. In this case, another planes and two islands. That'll finish paying the mana cost. And now, we've cast a spell. The Sarah Angel is ready to fight for us. So now we know how to cast spells, but when should we cast them, and why? And what happens to these spells after we cast them? We'll start answering some of these questions in part three. See you there. Hey, I'm Dylan. I'm Sam. Welcome back to the Magic the Gathering Learn to Play video series. We're up to part three. This is game zones and parts of the card. In the last video, we talked about tapping lands, producing mana, and casting spells. But we didn't really talk about how a game of magic is laid out. If you've ever played a board game, you know that the board typically sits between all the players, and the positioning of the pieces or the cards on the board can mean different things. That's right, but in magic there is no board. But cards can still mean different things depending on where they are. And the areas in which cards can be found throughout a game are called zones. There are four primary zones in magic. There's the library, the hand, the battlefield, and the graveyard. When you begin a game of magic, you shuffle your deck, set it down, becomes your library. Your library is a catalog of your adventures as a planeswalker. The lands you visited, the creatures you've encountered, all the spells you've learned, it's there. When you start a game, you draw seven cards. To draw a card, you take the first card off your library and put it into your hand. Your hand are the cards you have access to right now. The battlefield takes up most of the area between the players, so that's why your library sits off to the side. Most magic cards will end up on the battlefield, but cards you control generally stay on your side, while cards your opponent control stay on his or her side. The battlefield's where all the action takes place. It's also where creatures engage in combat. When creatures die, they go to the graveyard. The graveyard functions much like a discard pile. Most players keep their graveyard next to their library, like this. Cards can go to the graveyard for other reasons too, which we'll talk about more when we discuss card types in the next video. Now, let's look at the different parts of a magic card. And to do that, we'll need a card to look at. Here's Child of Night. The card's name is in the upper left corner. There are over 10,000 unique cards in magic, and that number is growing all the time. Slide over to the upper right, and there's the mana cost, which we know all about now. The artwork on the card has no effect on the game, but magic has some incredible art by some very talented people. Now, check out below the art. That's called the type line, where you see what type of card it is, like land, or in this case, creature. Over to the right is the expansion symbol. This symbol tells you what set the card came from. The color of the symbol tells the card's rarity. Child of Night's expansion symbol is black, telling you it is a common card. A silver expansion symbol, like you see here on Air Elemental, means an uncommon card. Rare cards like Shiv and Dragon have gold expansion symbols. And here's the top of the ladder, the mythic rare card. The fiery red expansion symbol tells you the card is exciting and very powerful. I mean, Bogarden Hellkite? That is no joke. You got that right. Now, looking again at Child of Night, let's check out that text box. The abilities of the card appear in normal type. Most abilities tell you exactly what they do, but some abilities, however, are summarized by a single keyword. For example, lifelink is a keyword. Keywords are often followed by italicized reminder text that'll explain more about them. Once you know what a keyword means, you'll be able to tell what a card does just by looking at the keyword. On the bottom of some cards, you'll find some flavor text. 
Flavor text has no impact on the game, but it gives you some insights into the characters and worlds of Magic. Toward the bottom right of creature cards, you'll find a box with two numbers. The number before the slash is the creature's power. It's a measure of its offensive capability, and also how much damage it deals in combat. After the slash is toughness. This is a measure of the creature's defense, and also how much damage it takes to destroy that creature. Now keep in mind that only creatures have power and toughness. On the very bottom of the card is some information that isn't pertinent to gameplay, but can be very useful to collectors. For example, the artist credit and the collector number, which can tell you who made your favorite art, and keep track of what cards of a set you have. And those are the parts of a magic card. As you get more familiar with them, you'll be able to tell a lot about every card very quickly. And in the next video, we'll really get into the differences between the card types and see how they're played and what they all do. We'll see you there. Hey, I'm Dylan. And I'm Sam. And we're here in part four of our Magic the Gathering Learn to Play video series. In this video, we're gonna learn about card types. Magic cards are grouped into types based on what they do. They tell you when a card can be played, but also what happens after a card is played. Remember, a card's type can be found roughly in the middle of the card, on the type line. So, to see the different card types in action, let's see some cards in play. The first type of card is one you may have seen before, lands. Lands are the building blocks for everything you do as a planeswalker. If you haven't already, make sure to check out our second video, The Five Colors of Mana. In that video, we show you everything you need to know about lands. All of these cards, including the lands, are permanents, meaning they stay on the battlefield. Cards that become permanents can only be played on your turn. The next card type is creatures, an important part of most magic strategies. Creatures range from the noblest of heroes to the most horrific monstrosities. Basically, there are a variety of beings that we command to do battle against our opponents. My Warpath Ghoul and Dylan's Runeclaw Bear are creatures. Let's take a closer look. On the type line, you'll notice not only that Warpath Ghoul is a creature, but also what kind of creature it is. It's a zombie. The most important thing about creatures is that they attack and block for you in combat. The power, found before the slash, tells how much damage a creature deals. Its toughness, found after the slash, tells you how much damage is required to destroy it. Our next card type is Artifact. Artifacts are magical treasures and items you can use in your duel. Artifacts don't usually require any specific color of mana to cast. Let's check out Rod of Ruin. As you can see, you can tap any four lands to cast Rod of Ruin. Artifacts have abilities that tell you what they do. The first part of this ability is a cost. This can be mana you have to pay or other instructions you have to follow. See that arrow symbol in the cost? That's the tap symbol, and it means you have to tap the card it's on to activate the ability. Let's see that in action. To activate Rod of Ruin's ability, I pay three mana by tapping three lands like this. I also have to tap Rod of Ruin itself. Now I've paid to activate the ability, so I get its effect, or the instructions found after the colon. In this case, I can deal one damage to a creature or player. Take that, Sam. Even though I have enough lands to pay three mana again, the Rod of Ruin is already tapped, so I have to wait until it untaps to activate the ability again. There's also a special type of artifact called Equipment. Equipment can be attached to creatures to give them bonuses. They enter the battlefield like any other artifact, but you can pay its equip cost to attach it to a creature once it's on the battlefield. Looks like Dylan's already gotten equipment out, so let's see how it works. Like Sam said, I cast Trusty Machete and Equipment, and it's now on the battlefield. My elite vanguard would love to have that, so I'll pay the equip cost of two mana, tapping two lands, and equip the Trusty Machete, like this. Trusty Machete gives the equipped creature plus two plus one, adding to its power and toughness. Now, the elite vanguard is no longer 2-1. He's a 4-2 machete wielding wrecking machine. Sweet, right? Equipment can really take creatures to the next level. Our next card type is enchantment. Enchantments are a lot like artifacts in that they stay on the battlefield and affect the game in crazy fun ways. Unlike artifacts though, most enchantments do require a specific color of mana to cast. I already have an enchantment on the battlefield. It's called Levitation. Let's take a look. Levitation gives all of my creatures flying. With this ability, there's no cost to pay, so the ability's just on, as long as Levitation remains on the battlefield. You can learn more about flying and other keyword abilities by going to wizards.com slash magic slash rules. Now, we just showed you a special kind of artifact called an equipment. Let's show you a special kind of enchantment called an aura. So here we have Oaken Form. Its first ability tells you what the aura must target when you cast it. In this case, a creature. 
its other abilities tell you the bonus the aura provides. Let's see that in action. I will cast that Oaken form by tapping a forest and two other lands. And I'll choose my Runeclaw Bear as the target. When the Oaken form enters the battlefield, it'll be attached to the Runeclaw Bear, enlarging it to an impressive 5 5. Hey, uh, Dylan, how about in the next video I get all the big creatures? Yeah, about that. Well, the final type of permanent is the Planeswalker. At this moment, I can hear you saying, hey, I thought you said we were Planeswalkers. Well, we did say that, but you can't visit all the worlds of the multiverse alone. You need backup in the form of these very powerful cards. In fact, they're so powerful, we dedicated an entire video to them. To see it, go make a search for a Planeswalker's primer for Conflux, Planeswalkers. The final two card types aren't permanents at all. They represent magical incantations or acts of wizardry. The first is called a sorcery. Like the permanents we've seen, sorceries can only be cast on your turn. When you cast a sorcery, its effect happens. That is, you follow the instructions on the card. Then it goes to the graveyard. To demonstrate, I'll cast Rampant Growth by tapping two of my remaining forests. Rampant Growth says for me to search my library for a basic land card and put that card onto the battlefield tapped. So. I will search for Forest, put it onto the battlefield tap, as it says, then shuffle my library. And just like that, we've cast a sorcery. The final card type we'll be talking about is the instant. Like sorceries, instants have their effect and then go to the graveyard. But unlike sorceries, you can cast an instant whenever you want. That's right. You can cast them on your turn, cast them on your opponent's turn, even cast them in response to another spell. Check this out. So I've decided that Elite Vanguard is getting a little annoying, and I have an instant called Lightning Bolt, which deals three damage to a creature or player. And even though it's Dylan's turn, I'm gonna cast that now. I don't think I like where this is going. I'll tap a mountain to pay the mana cost and aim the Lightning Bolt at the Elite Vanguard. Problem solved. Ah, but I have a response. Wait, what? I have a response. When players cast spells like Sam's Lightning Bolt just now, all players have the opportunity to respond by casting instants or activating abilities of their own. In this case, Sam, I'm going to respond to your lightning bolt by casting Giant Growth on my Elite Vanguard. The response, my Giant Growth, has its effect first. Giant Growth gives my creature plus three, plus three until the end of the turn. So my 4-2 Elite Vanguard, remember, he still has that trusty machete, becomes 7-5. My lightning bolt will still have its effect dealing three damage to the Elite Vanguard. But now that its toughness is greater than that, my lightning bolt won't even kill it. And a timely bit of spellcasting saves the day. It really is one of the things that makes magic so great. Moves, counter moves, foiling your opponent's strategy at the last possible moment. Yeah, well, we're about out of time, and I gotta go revise my plans for future games with this guy. <laughs> See you next time. Greetings Planeswalkers, I'm Dylan. And I'm Sam. This is part five in our Magic the Gathering Learn to Play video series. And this time, we'll be looking at all the parts of a magic turn. A magic turn follows a structure, but once you get the hang of it, it becomes second nature. And then you can focus on all the strategic ways to destroy your opponent. Yeah, we're gonna jump right into our game in progress in a minute. But first, let's take a quick look at the different parts of a magic turn. To do that, let's check out the chart. As you can see, a magic turn is divided into five phases the beginning phase, the first main phase, the combat phase, the second main phase, and the ending phase. Some of these phases are broken down into steps. Different things happen during each phase, and you can play certain types of cards depending on where in the turn you are. We'll kick things off with the beginning phase. To demonstrate how a turn works, let's take a look at our game. Right now, it's the start of my turn. The beginning phase has three steps. First, I will untap all my tapped permanents, so they're ready to use this turn. Only the player whose turn it is untaps their permanence. Sam will have to wait for his turn. When that's done, we will move to the upkeep. The upkeep step is mentioned on some cards. If something is supposed to happen during this step, the card will say, at the beginning of your upkeep, followed by whatever's supposed to happen. For example, if a cunning lethomancer is on the battlefield on my side, each player would have to discard a card at the beginning of my upkeep. This brings us to the draw step, where I draw my card for the turn. That concludes the beginning phase, and we move on to the first main phase. There are two main phases in a turn, one before combat and one after. It's my turn, so I can play a land during either of my main phases, 
but only one land per turn. I'll go ahead and play a forest now, so I have access to that mana should I need it during combat. It's a good plan. I can also play other spells during my main phase. I think I'll cast a creature now, this Crawl Worm, tapping two forests and four other lands. It's not my turn, so I can only play instants or activate abilities right now. That's all I want to do in my first main phase, so let's go to combat. This is my favorite phase. It's got armies fighting, creatures dying, surprise spells just in the nick of time. Combat's got it all. In fact, the primary way to win in Magic is to attack with creatures driving your opponent's life from 20 to 0. Combat is split up into five steps. First, the beginning of combat. Like the upkeep step, nothing specific happens unless a card says otherwise. It's also the last opportunity for anyone to do anything before attackers are declared. For example, if I wanted to destroy one of Dylan's creatures here before they attack, now would be the time to do so. We'll then move on to declare attackers. It's my turn, so I choose which of my creatures, if any, attack. The Crawl Worm can't attack because it has summoning sickness, meaning it just entered the battlefield this turn. My other two creatures can attack though, and that sounds like a good idea to me. Only untapped creatures can attack. When you declare creatures attacking, tap that creature. Creatures attack as a group, that is, you decide which creatures are going to attack, and they all tap at the same time. Now, let's move on to the third step in combat. Declare blockers. Dylan can't attack my creatures directly, he just declares that they're attacking. And because I'm the defending player, I get to choose if and how my creatures block. Now only an untapped creature can block, but blocking doesn't tap a creature like attacking does. Any of my attacking creatures that are unblocked will deal their combat damage directly to Sam, bringing me closer to victory. My Canyon Minotaur would love to snack on that elite vanguard, so it's gonna block there. All players can cast instants or activate abilities during most steps, and that's about to come in very handy. I will cast Giant Growth, targeting my elite vanguard. Ugh, I've seen this before. Giant Growth is an instant that gives a creature plus three, plus three for the turn. And now my elite vanguard is 5-4, ready to take on your suddenly outmatched Minotaur. And that brings us to combat damage. The battle happens and all attacking and blocking creatures deal their damage. My Pillarfield Ox, with a power of 2, was unblocked, so it deals 2 damage directly to Sam. Yep. Now my Canyon Minotaur deals 3 damage to the elite vanguard, whose toughness is now 4, so the elite vanguard survives. The elite vanguard, now with a power of 5, deals 5 damage to the Canyon Minotaur, whose toughness is 3. That's more damage than the Minotaur can handle, so it's destroyed and put into Sam's graveyard. The elite vanguard dealt more damage to the Minotaur than it needed to, but it was still blocked, so none of the damage is going to get to me. My heroic Minotaur took all of that damage, saving me a little pain. Damage stays marked on a creature until the end of the turn. If at any point during the turn a creature is dealt damage equal to or more than its toughness, it's headed to the graveyard, even if it didn't all happen at the exact same time. The final step in combat is called the end of combat, and like the beginning, nothing really happens here unless a card specifically says so, or someone activates an ability or casts a spell. And that will bring us on to the second main phase. Since it's my turn, I can cast more spells. I could also play a land, but since I already did that my first main phase, I'm gonna have to pass here. And since I have no instance to cast, I'll pass here too. And that'll bring us on to the ending phase. The ending phase has a couple of steps. The first is called the end step. And this is another one of those steps that something might not always happen, but cards can say otherwise, and this is also the last chance that either player has to cast an instant or activate an ability. To finish up the turn, we now go to the cleanup step. First, because it's my turn, I check to see if I have more than seven cards in my hand. If I do, then I need to choose and discard cards until I only have seven. Now, only Dylan has to do this because it's his turn. Right now, I can have more than seven cards in my hand. Not a problem. Then, two things are going to happen at the same time. One, all damage heals from creatures, and two, all effects that last until end of turn wear off. So, let's take a second look at that elite vanguard. It's still a 5-4 creature, thanks to that giant growth that was dealt three damage during combat. It'll go back to its normal size of 2-1, and all damage will be removed. And the turn is ready to pass. It's now Sam's turn, and we start again with his untap step. So, I'll untap all my tap permanents, just my lands in this case, and the game will continue. The creatures I tapped last turn to attack won't be able to block for me this turn, so knowing when to attack and when to hold back can be key. And that's a complete turn. This cycle repeats until one of us sees his victory. Yeah, he means me. Right. Now remember, if you have any other questions or need some more examples, just go to magicthegathering.com.
and that's it. We've got one more video to go where we're going to talk about building your own decks and getting connected with the Magic community around you. See you there. Hi everyone, I'm Sam. And I'm Dylan. No, no. you're Dylan. Here we go, yeah. yeah there. Okay. Sam there? Go yeah, on. all right. I'm Sam. And I'm Dylan. Welcome to the final part in our Magic the Gathering Learn to Play video series. This is the video called The Next Step. In the first five videos, we were talking about all the rules and how to play Magic the Gathering. But now, it's that next step. Growing your collection, building your deck, and getting connected to the Magic community around you. We are here at Games and Gizmos in Redmond, Washington. There are thousands of stores just like this one all over the world that serve as hubs for the Magic community around them. Every week, players just like you gather at game and hobby stores to check out the latest Magic product, trade ideas for deck building, and of course, most importantly, to play. Now, to get started, you're gonna need some cards. And there are plenty of Magic products out there. I mean, look at all this stuff. Let's check out some of the products you're likely to find at your local store. These are intro packs. Perfect for the beginning player, these are ready-to-play decks based on a single theme. Each Magic set has several different intro packs. Not only do you get the deck itself, but you also get a helpful guide on the deck's main strategies. Now, building your first deck can be really exciting, and many players get their inspiration from starting with an intro pack. Well, just look at this thing. Here's the deck you get, featuring a special foil card. And inside each intro pack is a booster pack. When you're ready to expand your collection, open up new deck possibilities, and explore deeper into the world of Magic, you gotta check out booster packs. They're the most popular Magic product, and they're how most players get new cards. Opening a booster pack can be really exciting. Let's check one out. Oh, some good stuff for some decks I'm making. And maybe some cards to trade later. Now, intro packs are great for getting you started, and booster packs can expand your collection rapidly. But there are plenty of other types of magic products you can get. Just talk to the folks at your game store and see what's available. One very cool thing to look out for, dual decks. Dual decks have not one, but two ready-to-play decks, so you can get started with a friend right away. Like the intro pack decks, each deck is centered on a theme, but dual decks take that to the next level, focusing on some of the greatest rivalries in the multiverse. Some are Planeswalker versus Planeswalker in a battle for supremacy, and others, they highlight epic encounters between civilizations where the stakes are nothing less than survival. Dual decks let you and a friend take control of history and see how it plays out. But how about creating a deck of your own and making a little history for yourself? Now, many players start down this path by taking an existing deck, maybe even an intro pack or a dual deck, and making some improvements. If you're changing or expanding an existing deck, though, we recommend you stay with the color or colors that are already there and have all the lands that produce the color of mana that you need. But don't forget about artifacts. Cards that don't require any specific color of mana can be used in almost any deck. Building a deck can be challenging, but it is so rewarding taking your own deck into battle. Here are some few things to think about when creating your own deck. Magic decks have a 60 card minimum, although you can have as many cards as you like. Be careful though, usually staying at 60 cards is a good idea. It makes it more likely you'll draw the card you want in any given situation. In an earlier video, we talked about creatures being the backbone of most successful strategies. So, let's start there. We recommend about two-fifths of your deck be creatures. So, in a 60-card deck, that's 24 creatures. To support those creatures, another fifth of your deck, or 12 cards, should be other types of spells. You can use enchantments to boost your creatures, instants and sorceries to deal with opposing threats, maybe even a planeswalker or two. Of course, to cast all these spells, you're gonna need some land. And that is the last two-fifths of your deck, or the final 24 cards in a 60-card deck. Remember, that's just a recommended starting point. As you get more duels under your belt, you'll figure out what strategies work best for you. A faster, more aggressive deck will probably use more creatures, while if you plan on using a more defensive deck, you'll likely use more spells to control the action. It's probably a good idea to focus on just one or two colors at first, but make sure to try different combinations. And don't forget to add the correct types of land based on the colors in your deck. Another great resource for players is the Daily MTG. That's the official Magic Web Magazine. You can go to dailymtg.com to see all the latest happenings in Magic. Every weekday, there are new articles that focus on everything from competitive strategy discussion to the fantastic worlds and characters portrayed in the Magic storyline. It's also full of weekly features that include insider Magic info and the latest news on upcoming sets and products. 
simply, it's the destination for magic on the web. And as we mentioned earlier, the destination for magic near you is likely a game store like this one. To help magic players find these locations and find each other, there's the Wizards Play Network. The Wizards Play Network, or WPN, is thousands of game stores and other locations that support magic. These locations offer organized tournaments for casual and competitive players, with a variety of cool prizes and exclusive promo cards up for grabs. Become a part of the magic community around you. I got my start by going to Friday Night Magic, one of the many programs the WPN offers. To find a WPN location near you, check out the store locator at wizards.com locator. And make sure to check out all of our other magic videos. We've got features on new sets as they're released, as well as tournament coverage, and a whole lot more. And that's it. We're done. And you're ready to play one of the most amazing games ever created. Remember, if you ever have questions or would like to know more, head over to magicthegathering.com. It is the first and last word for all things magic, and will connect you to all the other pages we've talked about in these videos. You'll also find an interactive demo that lets you practice a lot of the concepts we've taught you. Thanks for watching. And thanks for playing.